some uh, some of you might know me already, but if not, just real quickly, um, and I didn't even put it on here. This is this is brand new. Okay, I've never done this particular workshop before, and so I just realized I didn't even put my name on the first page, but it is on uh, one of the later slides. So y'all will have access to um, the slides and I will have a few um, activity worksheets um, that you can have as well. I'll show those to you along the way. Uh, but I teach, I'm an assistant professor at Southeastern Louisiana University um, with their uh, undergraduate social work program. And I've been there um, for, this is my fifth year now, <clears throat> and I've been teaching for Walden University and their online MSW program for seven years now. And, um, and I, before that I practiced in the field uh, for over 20 years. So I worked in a variety of settings, uh, started out in substance abuse and I worked inpatient, outpatient, adults, adolescents, um, you name it, I've pretty much worked it, <laughs> including methadone. <laughs> And uh, then I did some home-based family therapy. I've done some private practice um, with families and individuals and community-based mental health, as well as um, juvenile justice and um, a tr a treatment courts. So kind of been, been around a little bit, um, but I'll be honest and say I don't practice anymore. Uh, I mostly, uh, so I just, I teach and I do research at this point. So what I'm going to do is use, um, I mean, I use some examples based on my experiences, but also um, that I will need your help. So we will um, have some, a chance for, uh, I need a few brave souls <clears throat> to participate. So I'll talk about that in just a second. So as far as um, uh, building hope and confidence, I'm going to talk about the how those concepts play a key role in the change process. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about what uh, motivational interviewing calls the four corners. These are four situations related to confidence and importance and how it's helpful to identify those so you know where to work to point and point your strategies with your clients. Uh, I will go over nine strategies to build confidence. So these we will um, have a few activities that we'll do interactive. Um, and then same with uh, finding ways to identify and strengthen um, a person's sense of hope. So I mentioned participation. So we are going to try out some of the strategies. I'm just going to have to keep an eye on the time. Like I said, I, have, I haven't actually done this to a live audience yet. So uh, we will see how we're running on time and how many of them we want to do um, interactively and how many I just might explain um, and let you run with it. So um, there will be times that I do encourage you to um, post in the chat box. So uh, you can type responses and as I mentioned, there will be at least a few exercises. If I could get someone who is um, okay with um, unmuting their mic and uh, sort of being a kind of role playing a client for me, so to speak. And actually, we're not going to do the breakout rooms. Um, I realized I didn't set I did not set up my slide properly. So we'll just continue with the kind of interactive ones that you can have a chance to look at them, and we'll practice some of them together. So to sort of set the stage, um, motivational interviewing is the backdrop, is the, is the uh, framework from which I'm approaching the idea of building hope and confidence in your clients. So just to ensure we're all on the same page with motivational interviewing, that it is a collaborative goal-oriented style of communication. So not just a counseling approach, that um, it, it is something that Ideally, anybody can learn. I've trained paraprofessionals in this approach as well, um, but that it is very much a partnership. So it, it does come from that strength-based, very humanistic kind of Carl Rogers approach. So it is about collaborating with, with the client to determine the goals and how they want to go about uh, making that change. And then we do that by really listening to what we call change talk. And I'm not going to focus 
um, on all kinds of change talk. We're actually going to focus on confidence talk today, but it really is about learning how to hear um, those aspects of motivation and to build on them and strengthen their internal desires and commitment to make a change. And most importantly, that we do that in an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion. So we must, you know, leave judgment at the door um, and to be um, accepting of the person. Now, I've underlined Miller and Rolnick here because they wrote the book, and I'm going to mention their names a couple of more times as I discuss some of these concepts. So when I say Miller and Rolnick, I'm referring to Bill Miller and Stephen Rolnick, who literally wrote the book on motivational interviewing, helping people change. Um, and 2013 is the third edition and the most recent edition of their book. Let's see what else I have here. Okay, so what do we mean by hope, right? So the dictionary uh, defines hope as being a feeling of expectation and desire for certain thing, for a certain thing to happen, right? So we are hoping for something. And when we're talking about that in terms of client change, then we are talking about hope that uh, change is possible, that the client believes that they can change. Um, now, keep in mind that sometimes, uh, and part of what we're talking about this is, is they don't often come with a bunch of hope, right? That that may be limited due to uh, that sense of being demoralized and demoralized is that, um, you know, sense of hopelessness and loss of confidence. So helping them to build hope is the, as they, uh, as Millen Romnick said it, antidote to demoralization, that it redresses that sense or defeats that sense of hopelessness and loss of confidence. But it's also something that um, from a humanistic perspective is that it's, they have it within their capacity. It is within them. It's just buried under those feelings of being demoralized and that we just need to, you know, bring it back out and help it to grow and, and to strengthen it. So you heard that I mentioned the word confidence. So it's difficult to talk about confidence without hope. And it's difficult to have hope without confidence. So that is part of the real key of, of putting these two um, terms together, uh, yet they're not necessarily exactly the same. They just um, perhaps overlap. So now we're gonna talk about confidence. Oh, so I found this video. Uh, I'm just gonna show you like the first like two minutes of it. It's, it's a TED talk but it's just a little bit of humor about confidence. If you can just bear with me for a moment, let's make sure it works. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Who would like to be more confident? Great. I need a little dose myself uh, right now, as, as it turns out. Uh, but fellow confidence seekers, we are not alone. If you go to any bookstore, this is from amazon.com, you can learn how to get the ultimate self-confidence, unstoppable confidence, instant confidence. And if you're a dummy, there's a book for you too, Confidence for Dummies. We see confidence everywhere in our society. The government tracks consumer confidence. I was shopping at Best Buy the other day. They wanted me to buy with confidence. At Target, they want me to shop with confidence. On my way into work, I was behind this truck. How else can you shred, but with confidence? Any biologists out there who are working in your lab, don't you want to clone with confidence? This, this is real. I'm not, making, I'm not making these up. When you go home, what, what do you want to do? Well, you want to carve that turkey? With confidence, that's the main thing, a little dressing on the side, maybe. I'm a faculty member at Ohio State. How do they want me to retire? With confidence, with confidence of course. And then when my life is over, how am I going to go out with, with confidence? <laughs> so I thought that was a little bit humorous. 
Um, but it does show us, though, how much confidence, right? It really is an important concept. And I'm just wondering, you know, how much, um, sorry, how much attention do we do we bring to the to the idea? I mean, I, I I doubt any of us would say that confidence isn't important, but just how important is it? So the dictionary defines confidence as a feeling of self assurance rising from one's appreciation of one's own abilities or qualities. So you could see where confidence is tied to one's sort of sense of self efficacy, right? That uh, you have the capability of um that you have some sense of capability sorry and that self-efficacy reflects confidence in the ability to exert control over one's own motivation behavior and social environment so i like that um, that really pulls together what we mean by confidence and how it really is related to the process of change, that if we do not have that self-efficacy, that we don't have confidence in our ability to control, right? To have control over that change process, then people are unlikely to commit to a change. Um, and Miller Mollick say that even lack of confidence can be an obstacle even to acknowledging the importance of the change. So if someone does not feel confident about making a change, then they also might consider it to be not important. Now, it's not always true, but it certainly can happen. So here's our first poll. I think I have to, do I need to stop sharing to get to the poll? Hang on. No, here it is. Okay, so I'm gonna launch the poll. So how important, sorry, hang on, let me sit over here. How important do you think it is to evoke a strong sense of hope and confidence from your client? So I've got very important, important, someone important or not important. Do I need the Jeopardy music here? Do, 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 do. <laughs> Just kind of wait and see if any more of you're going to participate. Pretty good so far. Got 74% participation. 75%. Give it a few more seconds. It actually has a timer on here for me, so I can see one, one minute. 59. All right. And poll. So clearly, here, let me say share results. Here we go. Okay. So, um, so almost 70% of those who responded to the poll said that it's very important. And 27% said that it's important. So that's, uh, if I can do the math, y'all, 69, 79, 89, 98. Am I doing that? I'm doing that wrong. 96%? Yeah, sorry. So 96% felt it was at least important, if not very important. So I'm not going to pick on the two people who said somewhat important. Hopefully I'll change your mind by the end of, by the end of this uh, session here. <laughs> Hang on, let me move this out of the way. Okay. So thinking about the ingredients for successful change, I'm sorry, ingredients for change or for motivation. Um, now, Mil I will say this, that Mill and Rolnick do not um, view that, they do not view motivational interviewing as a complete theory of how people change, uh, but it certainly is a great starting point. And so to help um, kick off that change process, motivation encompasses the concept of ready, willing and able. So some of you have been in my workshops have heard me go over this before. Um, so just bear with me for those who might not have heard, heard this perspective. Um, but the cliche ready, willing and able actually is a great uh, framework for thinking about motivation. It kind of simplifies it. Maybe it's oversimplified, yes, but um, it's again, it's a great starting point to think about, you know, how ready is my client. And we often say that, right? People aren't going to change until they're ready. But readiness 
is only one really kind of it's kind of the ultimate um maybe the last step in terms of committing to change because it it involves the sense of priority and importance placed on that change so you know when it's a priority then we spend time and energy and focus on that on making that change right but also before we even get to that point we have to also be willing and so you know we say ready willing and able but it really should be willing able and ready that technically that's more like how it tends to go and that the willingness is is simply that recognition that something probably should or needs to change so you could see where there might be a lot of ambivalence at this point um, that maybe they're not ready to prioritize it because they know they should, but it doesn't mean they really want to or think they can. So there's typically other obstacles, and we'll talk just a smidge about that a little bit later. Um, but at least recognizing that's the basic problem recognition that without problem recognition, the change isn't likely to happen. And it certainly isn't going to be lasting change. So problem recognition comes first. And um, if your client does not have problem recognition, then uh, make sure you review the webinar on developing discrepancy. We also have the term uh, able, right? So ready, willing, and able. So able or ability is the confidence that someone has in their ability to make or implement that change. So, you know, thinking about confidence, right? That um, that's what we're going to talk about like well how do we help somebody get more confident right that even even uh someone who might have the knowledge and skills to do it still might not believe in their ability to make the change so you could see where if it's if there's a lot of questioning about their ability that they might not put the priority to it because that only leads to disappointment right that if they're not successful then they're not confident to implement the steps needed to get there then they're going to place it uh, at lower importance um, so the level of confidence that someone has um, what does it say? Confidence can impact the level of importance assigned to a goal for change. So uh, low confidence can lead to low importance. That's basically what we're saying, right? And that importance or that readiness often can come last. But you have to figure that out. So again, that may not be, I'm sorry, that may not be true for, something's happened with my image here. I have lost something happened here. Sorry, y'all. I'm having an issue here with my um, slide. And I'm not sure why it's doing that. It's like it show, it's not showing up to you guys, right? Are you seeing it? This is just blank. It just says four corners. But then on my preview, it's showing it. This is very strange. Hang on just a second. I may have to. Angie, is it animated? Did you have to click to make the picture show up? I think so. Um, let me try going back to it again. Let me try it. Well, no. Yeah, see, I okay. tried it on this thing too. All right. Well, that is really strange, but I will see if I can adjust it for you guys. Yeah, I will, um, I'm flexible like that. I'm type B, so y'all are in luck. Okay, so <laughs> look, I'm just making it work. <laughs> um, okay, so the four corners relate to importance and confidence. So as I mentioned that um, the, I just lost the other one. It was importance and confidence ready Let's see, desire, ability, reasons. Um, Cause I'm trying, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think about what else Miller and Rollick, ready, willing. Okay, so the willing, cause I'm trying to remember my stuff here, y'all. So the idea of the willingness, the problem recognition is kind of assumed at this point. So to use the four corners, 
um, we're assuming that your client already has that problem recognition, that they know there's something they should change. So where are they in terms of how important it is and how confident are they? So, you, um, so as you have interviewed and worked with your client, that you might assess them in one of these four um, categories or corners. So the first, um, first quadrant, so this one right here, um, yeah, and I made this, this is a table and I, I'm just not, I can do a lot with, with PowerPoint, but this just was not, it was gonna take too much work. So <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm just gonna use my little thing here. So the first quadrant um, really is sort of the ideal, right? That the client uh, ascribes a high importance to the change and describes feeling very confident about making that change. So if they are seem to fall under quadrant number one, then you do whatever it is you do, right? So you're doing CBT or cognitive, or sorry, um, dialectical behavioral, um, what else, uh, Lindsay, you guys have EMDR and um, multi-systemic family therapy, whatever, right, whatever you guys use. So you move forward and, and those should um, um, be able to be applied with the client sufficiently motivated. Now, the second quadrant um, is a little bit less than ideal, but it's still very good to use with motivational interviewing, which is maybe their confidence is high. Oh yeah, you know, if I want to change that, I know I can, I just don't want to, it's not that important. So if the importance is low, but the confidence is high, um, you can then address that issue of importance that how do you make the, uh, the change more important so that they will prioritize it and actually put forth the effort to make that change. Um, and so part of that might come from, again, I refer you back to previous webinars that I did on eliciting change talk and then also developing discrepancy. So it's often importance relates to someone's value system and what their personal goals are. And so what you want to do is try to help bring out just how important um, that that particular change might be to them, to their goals. Um, how does not working towards that change maybe go against their values and their goals? So if you help them frame it that way, uh, that can help. That can help develop that prioritization. In the third quadrant, now we have importance is high, but confidence is low. So this could happen, as I mentioned that you know, we're really kind of looking at number four, um, but it is possible. They say, I really do want to do this. This is very important to me. I just don't even know how. I, you know, I feel so defeated. I've been trying and nothing seems to work. I don't know how I'll, how I'll ever succeed. So it could be that there's just a current sense of demoralization um, and that that can be addressed through um, the confidence uh, exercises that I'm going to um, go over with you. So the fourth one is the least ideal, of course, and that is that um, that there is low importance and low confidence. You know, I just I don't see how I could do it. It's just not that important. So it's sort of a general giving up um, that they just um, uh, might be even um, more demoralized than the person that's in quadrant three. Still move forward with the strategies that we are going to be talking about. Um, and it just may take some more time to work on this sense of confidence and hope. This, uh, hopefully that makes sense to you. So you want to kind of evaluate where your client is. And one of the things that you know, I found helpful in, in using motivation interviewing as one of your tools is, is that idea of, you know, where are they? You know, we talk about starting where the client is, but how do we really uh, evaluate where they are? Uh, and so I, I do like this idea of looking at being willing, able, and ready. So do they even recognize the problem? Um, and then we get at, you know, how confident are they in addressing it and how important is it to them to put forth the effort. Right. So, 
So the one is the person who has high confidence and high importance and they don't really need to do any of the stuff I'm gonna talk about. So that's the client that's probably ready, willing, and able to go ahead and work on whatever the issue is, and you use whatever techniques you use. So number two um, might have the confidence, but you're gonna address the importance. So the importance is gonna come from a strategies I talked about with eliciting change talk and developing discrepancy. And then in three, it is the um, where they have low confidence, but it's very important. And then with four, there is low confidence and low importance. So both of these three and four um, is really what we're targeting with the strategies in this particular session, that these will be applicable to their sense of low confidence. All right, then strategies. Um, hang on, I do, and actually I do need to get back to my slideshow because I do have some, what do you call it, move, you know, some slides, like I don't show you everything, whatever, right? <laughs> I have some animations and some of them. Okay, here we go. All right, okay. And all right, so strategies to build confidence. So there are nine, and I would, and I would say that, you know, yeah, strategies is the best word I could come up with. Um, but these, some of these um, aren't as, um, what's the word when you, you know, when something's completely separated, right? These aren't in silos. Um, some of these can sort of overlap or work together. Um, and some aren't so much as an activity as it is, you know, uh, keeping in mind what our focus might be and what we're listening for and what we might be asking. So I'm going to talk about each of these um, confidence rule, uh, confidence talk. You all have heard the confidence ruler, um, but I'm going to show you something else, something else that you can try with that. Giving information advice, we'll briefly mention. Um, we'll talk about strengths, reviewing past successes, um, reframing, hypothetical thinking, and then responding to it. So these are all kind of work together to help build confidence in our clients. So Miller and Ronald talk about confidence talk. So when I mentioned change talk earlier, you know, we're listening for um, language, you know, the, the client's words that tell us that they want to change, they have reasons to change, maybe even need to change, but also how confident they are in their ability to change. So that's all change talk, broadly speaking. And we're going to focus on confidence talk. So asking questions that could potentially elicit that confidence talk from them. So these are actual questions that you might ask like how might you go about making this change? So we don't wanna ask this too early in it. Remember we said we wanna say, well, how could you do that different? Like we're trying to fix it right away, but it would be at some point that we are trying to find out um, just some other thoughts about it. You know, how, what thoughts do you have about making this change? How, how if you did do it, particularly someone who maybe isn't committed to making that change is still ambivalent, but you say, well, if you did make that change, how would you go about doing it? What might be a good first step? What might be just one thing that you could do? Um, given what you know about yourself, how could you make this change successfully? So what things about you could help you make this change? What obstacles do you foresee? So there are times to ask about barriers to change. And what um, and then uh, listen for language where they say, you know, I could, I can, I'm able to, it's possible. So those are just some terms that you might hear from the client and try to elicit from them their ideas for how best to do it. Um, so that's particularly true to this is part of that collaboration and eliciting it from the client rather than trying to tell them how we think that they should go about this particular change. Um, now you'll notice on starting now on a bunch of these slides is I have some um, uh, numbers up here, it says EX and then 3.13. So um, at the end of the slides, I do have information about um, purchasing my book if you're interested, no pressure. 
Um, but I just thought if you were interested or maybe you were are getting my book that I'm showing you where you can find some exercises that link with this particular strategy. So there is an exercise that's in, so part three, three means the third chapter, part three, and it's the exercise number 13. Um, and I want to look at, okay, so what I have here is an example. What thoughts, okay, so here I have like sort of a, a script that um, I kind of made to get us started and then help us think about um, what you might um, say or ask next that still gets at trying to get some confidence talk. So remember we said we were trying to get at, for example, you might ask about potential steps, right? Steps to make a change. All right, so I am going to um, talk with Sam and um, she has been in and out of psyche. She's 17. She's been in and out of psychiatric hospitalizations. Um, she's been diagnosed with bipolar and uh, she's, she's gets stable. And then it seems like the medication stop, stop working. So we're targeting her management of her mood swings. So I'm gonna ask her, um, what thoughts do you have about taking steps towards managing your moods? And she says, I'm not sure. It seems like I've tried everything. Let's see. Um, one thing I try to do is let my mom know when I'm feeling off and I just want to be left alone so no one triggers me. So I say, sounds like you are able to be aware of your mood shifts and can communicate that to someone. Yeah, but she doesn't always leave me alone. She says, that's the last thing I need to do. Well, what do you think? I just don't want anyone or anything to set me off. So isolating yourself to avoid triggers is an important step to take, I guess. Well, you sound unsure. I mean, I can't stay in my room all the time. I wanna see my friends, right? So isolating yourself might not be the best step. Blank, right? So where do I go from here? So thinking about those questions that get at taking steps, confidence talk, what might be the next thing that you say? And I probably would ask a question. So what, what kind of question might you ask? So you put those in the chat. <laughs> this is chat box time. <laughs> All right, so Billy, thank you. Billy says, what is another thing that has worked well for you before? Excellent, yeah. So keep trying to get something for her to say something, right? So what other ideas do you have or what's maybe worked for you in the past, right? You can absolutely ask it that way. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's pretty much what I, what I was thinking, you know, what other ideas do you have? So you keep them brainstorming. So if people remember um, eliciting change talk, part of it was elaboration, examples, what else? to not be afraid to keep asking. Now, this doesn't mean that at some point, uh, maybe she doesn't know that you ask, you know, what else um, or what's worked for you before? What other thoughts do you have? And, and this is a teenager, right? So they often kind of shrug their shoulders and say, I don't know. <laughs> um, so then it's okay to say, well, um, you know, there, there have been some things that other um, clients have found helpful. Do you mind if I share those with you? So then it's okay to share those and then get the reaction, which we'll talk about that in just a minute. All right, so um, the second strategy is the confidence ruler. So many of you have already seen this before. Um, this is, uh, there are parts of this included in my um, book as well that gets the person to think about, you know, how do you rate your level of confidence? Uh, if you remember, the rulers can also cover importance. So you can ask on a scale from one to 10 or zero to 10, how important is it to you? So right now, like I said, we're focusing on confidence. So um, the important thing is to ask, you know, how confident are you that you could do this? And you can use this for broadly speaking, like how confident are you can make this change, but you could ask it, maybe there's certain 
aspects of the change plan or ideas they had that you say, well, how confident are you that you could do that specific thing, like avoid friends or avoid, you know, uh, for me, it's avoiding chocolate, right? So how confident are you that you could do that specific um, activity or task? And then um, making sure that you follow that up with, why are you a, and then whatever number they chose and not a zero or some other lower number. Um, that really is what's motivational interviewing. And so we are trying to get at, um, why are you a five and not a one? Um, so you're trying to get them to say, well, why, why are you at least somewhat confident, right? If they picked a five, they're somewhere in the middle. So sometimes I find I have to rephrase it that way to make sure the participant understands that that's what I'm asking, right? Because sometimes you'll say, why a five and not a one? They'll make excuses for why it's not higher than a five and kind of misinterpret the question but that that's that happens and so you just focus like well but why is it some, redirect them and say why is it at least somewhat why are you at least somewhat confident what's what what's the difference between a five and a two or whatever so you can use it that way to really get them to think about that will help them say why where is somewhat confidence here and that might lead the way to talking about past um, successes right so it'll be important for them to talk about aspects of their confidence. Now you can um, also get to the point where you say, well, what would it take to go from a five to a six? Um, what would help you to be just that little bit more confident? So that might be um, something that they could potentially think about is what might be helpful. Now, if they say they're a seven, eight, nine, or even a 10, um, then you know, you might, you could still say, well, you know, what makes it that high? You know, what tells you, what leads you to have that level of confidence? And that would still be really good to talk about, but generally you're not necessarily talking about going like, well, what does it take to go higher? It's already, they're already pretty confident. Um, so I might, for that person, I might explore more about importance rather than confidence. Now there's a new activity that I realized I have in my book. <laughs> and this is called um, setting a floor and a ceiling. So in the book, um, I have the reader to um, describe, you know, thinking about their target um, change and whatever it is that they wanted to change, and then talk about what does low confidence look like? So they briefly describe, um, hopefully, one through 10, right? So if you start out with, hang on, let me find it in my book here. I don't think that this, um, the, the, I'm gonna show you some of the example exercises. This is not the official one. This is not in the handouts, but I am giving you some of these. I cannot give you all of them. It has to do with the publisher <laughs> and what I'm allowed to share. Um, but so let me find the, where this one is in the book, which is sitting right next to me. Hang on. Sorry. I should have uh, marked this one. Um, the confidence rulers and there we go. Um, so here we go. 70. It's on page 70 <laughs> and, oh, here we go. Okay. Oh, there's actually a couple exercises I have them do. Um, to, to work up to this. There's um, where I have them first talk about talk, you know, what's the best thing that could happen if you make this change and what's the worst thing that could happen if you don't. So that kind of helps them sort of set the, the low, um, the low and the high. And then I have them kind of defining confidence. Like there's a bunch of terms for them to pick from. Um, you know, what kind of terminology makes you think about confidence. And then what they do is then they take these, um, I put these one through 10, I think in my book, it's actually 10 through one, but um, you know, what does a, um, if you are a 10 on the confidence scale, what might that look like? So here, let me do, I'm trying to think how it works because I also said I would keep track of time and we'll do what we can. I think we're doing okay, huh? Um, 
let's do, let's try this one a little bit. We'll see how far we can get. So this is where I need some participation. And um, let's think, um, should we start with 10? We can start with 10 and say, um, you know, if your confidence, let's see, let's try to think of a change. Um, should we take Sam and think about if she is um, super high confident about her ability to manage her mood swings, what might that confidence look like? Like, what does that mean? What is she maybe able to do? What is she able to do? What does that confidence look like? If she is able to manage her mood. So if I'm confident about my ability to manage my moods, I have alternatives in mind, right? I have alternatives I know will help me. Sorry about my thing. I thought about this late. This is what I did not. This is a slide I should have fixed and did not fix. So that's all right. <laughs> I will have alternatives, which I know will help me cope. Okay. Right. And, and I use them, right? I know that I'll use them. Um, so what might a nine then look like? And I kind of thought about this too, where even if you didn't do like every single one, at least kind of doing, maybe let's do that and like do a halfway. So what might a moderate, if she's moderately confident, what might that feel like for her? Like I'm, I'm somewhat confident I can manage my moods because mm, I'm thinking too. <laughs> um, see, I have alternatives that will help me cope. Um, all right, here, actually, I'm underline it, sorry. I have um, some ideas like maybe calling someone to talk to cope with the mood swings, all right? And if she has like next to no confidence, what does that feel like? Mm. Can't control my mood, yeah. I can't control my mood, no ideas. Yeah, stuck in my room. <laughs> Nothing helps, right? Out of control. Exactly, yeah, thank you. Okay, so Let me get myself back to where I was. <laughs> okay, so this might be a way to, again, you can maybe fill in a couple more in here, um, but just kind of helping them think, you know, what does that confidence look like? And that might also help that if you ask them, um, you know, what would it take to go from a five to a six, then it might be easier to conceptualize that and to say, well, it means then that I maybe have more ideas, right? You know, this might be like, I have some ideas, I have lots of ideas. Um, you know, I, I have ideas and I use them most of the time, right? However, their uh, perception ends up um, sort of lining that out, okay? Um, I also have done this, the sitting, the floor and the ceiling can also be done with importance as well. So I mentioned the giving information and advice so I'll just kind of reaffirm this is, so this is just simply saying that, you know, there are times that we are, you know, as much as we need to collaborate and elicit from the client, 
that we acknowledge that there are times that they run out of ideas, um, just feel so unsure about their ideas that um, then we may step in with information or suggestions. So generally, you know, it says information advice. Generally, we should refrain from giving advice. Advice meaning, I think you should do X <laughs> um, and not Y. So being that specific, you know, really leaves yourself open to being, um, you know, kind of judged later, right? So if the client uses it and it doesn't work, um, then that can really be harmful to your relationship, um, trust with the client. But if you say, here are a few suggestions um, then, um, there, and, and we also need to emphasize that it's up to them to decide. So here are a few suggestions that other clients have found helpful. Um, you know, what do you think about that? What are your thoughts? Which one appeals to you the most now? And I do understand there may be times you'd have to give specific, like doctors can give specific advice, right? Um, we want to be more careful because we're more, you know, behavioral health is sometimes, um, less predictable than meta, than uh, physical health. But, um, you know, if there are times, for example, you know, the clear advice is that you need to stop, you know, taking opiates. I think that's, <laughs> that's probably very good advice, right? <clears throat> um, but, you know, though, generally speaking, or sometimes they even ask you, like, what do you think I should do? And we generally say, well, I really think that's up to you, but here are some options. So again, it's kind of avoiding giving too much specific advice, but it is giving suggestions um, or perhaps sharing information. So I don't really have any activities on that one. That's just sort of a something we do, okay? Um, so now we get to strengths. So this one I, um, I like too, right? So we're all, and in, in, um, you know, I know, I've, like I said, I'm a social worker, so I come from that perspective and we, we definitely, um, promote a strengths perspective. And that's really what this, what this does, right? Is it helps to identify what their strengths are and um, to affirm them. So using affirmations <clears throat> is an important piece of helping to build a client's sense of confidence. So hearing it from you that it isn't, you know, affirmations aren't just about saying, oh, you're a nice person, you're a good person. Like it's not about vague stuff like that um, or common things. It has to do with that person. So what characteristics or um, skills or, you know, different things that they, um, efforts that they've made, anything that you can find that can help um, them the, to help reinforce those strengths that they have. So that really is an important piece of confidence building. Another way is though to get them to look at a list and identify um, a bunch of them. So I have a list and this is one of the exercise worksheets that you will be um, given. And it is, let me see, 319. Let me see, I'm gonna find that in my book here to have it in front of me. Okay, so here we go. Um, so exercise 3.19 lists a bunch of common characteristics of successful changers. And it is actually, it's not even a complete list. I think if you go to the Miller and Ronick book, they include the entire list. Um, but it, these are common characteristics of successful changers. I don't know, I couldn't find any particular um, specific research on it. This was just from the Miller and Ronick book. So <laughs> that's the best I have on it. Um, but it, it really is some, some interesting, um, you know, characteristics that people might not normally think about unless they look at a list. You can also have their loved ones um, identify their strengths. Um, and how have they demonstrated these strengths and how can these strengths help them be successful? So for example, my apologies, I'm not sure how well you guys can see it because I couldn't, um, because of the way it's laid out, like I can't zoom it in. Um, but again, you do have the, you will have the worksheets. So some of the common characteristics um, in the, in this activity, I asked them to um, circle all that apply. And then at the bottom right here is choose two characteristics and describe a time you showed each quality. So this is their time to sort of brag on themselves, right? So in what ways have you shown that? So you can um, share that same list with a loved one or a family member, a trusted friend, 
and ask them to, and this is this other sheet you will have, <clears throat> they see your strengths. And so they identify three characteristics and describe what have you seen or heard me do that makes you think I have this characteristic? So we look at these. I was trying to think if I had a thing that we were gonna do. Um, who, um, now is there anybody, let's see, let me think if I can um, try to, I might be able to, I'm just gonna have to go back and forth on this. Um, here we go. Does that help you guys see them a little bit better? I don't have my reading glasses on. Um, so if um, you were to, I'm trying to think of an example here. Um, if you were to pick one about yourself, let me get one person to volunteer um, and you can, you can unmute to discuss this one. Why don't we do this verbally? that pick one of these and maybe describe a time that you showed that quality. Who's brave? There's like 68 of you, so somebody. <laughs> I don't think there's a raise your hand, is there? I don't see a raise your hand option. So uh, this is Tina Fell. I, I saw the one that was, um, I guess you could use um, assertive or attentive when you're asking questions by involving myself in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> normally a quite quiet person. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that does, that shows assertiveness uh -huh. and that you took a chance to participate. Thank you. Now, does somebody, um, like, is there anybody out there that your, your like, colleague or friend is um, in the same, like, I know sometimes y'all are in, like, an office and you're actually sharing the monitor right now. There might be some of you in that position. Like, how, um, is there anybody in that situation that you could um, choose one of these characteristics of your colleague and share an example? somebody's horn <laughs> or just any colleague they don't even I guess they don't have to be here you don't have to say their name <laughs> think of a colleague One more person. Come on, one more. <laughs> Besides Tina. <laughs> I love the background, Tina. <laughs> Tiffany, Dale. Alice, Billy, <laughs> I'm gonna start calling names. <laughs> One more person. So I just want you to pick somebody that you know, could be a colleague and identify one of their strengths and how you think they demonstrate that strength. Okay, this is Denise Bro. I'll Thank go. You. Um, I want to uh, talk about Janice Sylvester. Um, she's on the call. She's a lot of these strengths, but um, one that I would definitely say um, is one of her biggest strengths, I guess, would be, um, it's not on here as a strength, but I'm going to add it, um, very compassionate, and I guess, and knowledgeable, um, because she, um, she demonstrates that when she works with our clients, um, she's knowledgeable about resources and what they what can help them and kind of bridging that gap when they are in um, a situation 
that is um, kind of challenging because she manages our crisis team. And so she's very compassionate with the, um, with the clients, um, but also very knowledgeable in terms of helping them not tell them what they need to do, but helping them um, express what their needs are so that we can make sure we are pointing them in the right direction. Mm -hmm. so. Great, thank you. Janice, is that a little um, confidence booster there for you? <laughs> I think maybe Janice and I, Janice, have we met? I think you've been in some of my workshops. Great, awesome, thank you. Okay, so let me go to, back over to this thing. All right, and so this was just the, um, uh, the worksheet for the um, loved one or family member to fill out. So we've mentioned reviewing past successes, so that's hopefully not surprising. Um, but that's this is definitely one way to, um, you know, help them think about ways that they have already changed or made successful changes that can inspire their uh, inspire ideas as well as the confidence to make the current needed changes. This is also um, a solution focused therapy um, approach, uh, strategy, sorry, strategy as well. So trying to review past successes to look for potential solutions, um, but it also does build confidence. So that's, it really has a twofold um, importance to this, this particular strategy. So again, it doesn't have to be about the same necessarily, uh, doesn't have to be the same issue that they're dealing with now. It could be a completely separate issue. And sometimes people don't make those kind of connections easily or without some kind of guidance. So asking them things about what changes have you made in your life that were difficult, especially maybe if they were difficult, you know, what kind of challenges have you already faced and how did you do that, right? How did you do that is a solution focused question. Um, what led you to make that change and how have you maintained it? So again, looking for ideas and building confidence. What obstacles were there and how did you overcome them? So when you think about um, the obstacles, um, they're actually, I have, um, I, I realized today that I didn't put all of those on the slide um, as far as the number, but there's a bunch of exercises that I have in the book that are about these different obstacles. And some of those include, um, so let me think here for a second. If I have um, someone who, let's see, what obstacles, let me move my stuff around here. I'm trying to see, <laughs> I'm running out of room. Um, actually here, maybe I can move the, here we go. I'm trying to move the chat box where I can still see it, but I need to see my, notes over here. All right, so obstacles. So um, I, I'll ask all of you, I guess you don't have to unmute, but type. Um, so think about a change you've made that was difficult for you. Maybe something you've been successful at or were successful at changing in the past. So um, think about something you changed and then what kinds of obstacles did you face? So here's where it might be helpful to have sort of a framework to help the client think about these potential um, obstacles. So this can be, you know, obstacles about a past success, but you can also talk about it in terms of obstacles for the current issue at hand. So one of them might be um, fall under internal. Thank you, Connie. We're going to use that. <laughs> so um, asking about internal obstacles that maybe you had. So internal obstacles can include maybe your attitude towards whatever it was you needed to change. It could be relate to maybe a missing knowledge to accomplish the change, or maybe just beliefs that you have about yourself, 
um, or about something about beliefs about making that change. So um, what were there any internal obstacles like that, Connie, that you faced when you moved? Grief. Yeah. So thinking about um, maybe miss you're missing maybe friends or family, the, your life that was in Alabama. I have to think about the um, example, Un unhealthy eating habits, <laughs> yeah. job change, even if I didn't. Um, so let's see, so like Tanya's talking about um, unhealthy eating habits that, you know, our attitude might be like, for example, having um, maybe a negative attitude towards like healthy foods, right? Um, eating a bunch of um, fruits and vegetables just don't seem very appealing. Um, maybe having a belief that, you know, if I, um, if I eat those foods, then I'm denying myself that I'm feeling restricted from something. Or maybe just knowledge, maybe just feeling like I, I just don't even know how to change my eating habits. So those would be internal obstacles. Um, external uh, and these just um, and it kind of playing off of what um, Michelle also says uh, um, identifying like worst case scenarios if I did or if you didn't move uh, change jobs that I'm mean, we're doing a pros and cons is very good Michelle but if we are um, you know kind of doing the uh, catastrophizing about it and um, you know, having more negative thoughts about the change, those our beliefs are more negative, then obviously that's going to make it harder to change. So you could see where there's definitely CBT stuff um, infused in my book. <laughs> so I do talk about your beliefs and stuff as well. And how some of those, what are your thinking patterns that keep you stuck and not changing? Yeah, it helps reduce catastrophizing. Um, so then there's external obstacles that could also occur. So financial obstacles. So if Michelle wanted to change jobs, but it doesn't pay quite as well, she might have to think about that. Like, well, that's, you know, financially, that would be an obstacle to me to change jobs. Or this is going to go back to Connie. Like if Connie, you know, was thinking um, that, um, you know, there are, different financial, like the move itself might be very costly, right? So that could be an obstacle. Um, what else? There could be social obstacles. So um, that might be similar to what Connie was talking about, like changing friends. Um, you know, how do you, how do I find where to make new friends? Um, that was something I know, um, I moved to Louisiana from Illinois 21, 21 years ago now, but um, I've lived here quite a while now, but I still remember moving because I've never lived outside of Illinois. So we moved down here and it's my husband and I, and I just didn't know how we were supposed to make friends. You know, we didn't know we had friends from college. Like we had a circle of friends. We um, played in bands and did music. So we had a social circle built in and uh, where we used to live in Illinois and then we moved down here and there was no one. Um, other than work. So that really was kind of what I ended up doing was hanging out with a bunch of his um, colleagues from, from work. And we've certainly built a ton of friends now. Um, I've had different jobs. I've met lots of great friends from work. And um, I have a daughter who's 13. So I've met a bunch of other people that way too. Um, yeah, let's get to that in just a second, Connie. That's a great point. Um, there could be cultural um, cultural obstacles. So sometimes when people talk about trying to eat healthier, um, you know, some cultures really, you know, have uh, a certain focus on, say, you know, a lot of foods with salt and rice and um, some other like maybe high fat foods, um, you know, that might be um, if the family's very much into kind of that, really that Southern cooking, um, 
that's not even just soul food, but it's Southern cooking of, you know, frying everything and that that might be an obstacle, right? That culturally, that's part of the culture. Then there could be environmental stressors. That could be another external obstacle to making the change. Um, and so that's Connie had um, posted here about in the chat about it being more difficult during COVID-19. That would be an environmental stressor, right? Um, it could be, um, you know, like maybe say a, a work environment or, you know, things like that, that could get in the way of you making that change. And lastly, there could be even laws or regulations. Um, I found, I had one example in the book that's kind of humorous, but, um, you know, do the laws or regulations affect your ability to make that change? So for example, <clears throat> if you are, well, here's a non-funny one. If you are an LMSW, um, you know, you are, there's certain jobs that legally you cannot do because you're not an LCSW. So that would be an obstacle, right? Um, and one that can be overcome with time, but, uh, or the funny one was if somebody wanted to um, grow marijuana, um, they probably can't do that in Louisiana. I think they'd have to move to Colorado. So, you know, thinking about uh, that kind of obstacle to making your change, making a change and achieving your goals. So I hope that that's kind of helpful to think about that those are all different activities that I have um, in the book to help really think through what those obstacles might be. And then obviously from there would be, you know, ways for them to brainstorm ways to address those obstacles if they wanted to. Um, there's also resources. We talked about the strengths a little bit already but there's actually um, a section on resources. So I took some, some similar from the obstacles, um, but I all looked at it in terms of like financial or economic resources. So, um, you know, if I really wanted to join Noom, that weight loss app, if I wanted to pay for that again, I did it once before. If I chose to do that, I could afford to pay for that. So I have financial resources. Um, maybe strengths about one's family or other support systems is kind of mentioned in here. And we all know that having a good support system is also part of successful um, recoveries and change. Um, resources in terms of time management and managing your personal structure. So this actually kind of takes um, a bit of, um, takes a little bit from mindfulness I pulled from all kinds of places, y'all, to come up with these different, because I had to come up with um, 110 exercises are in this book, 110. So I definitely had to draw on some other resources, but I thought about mindfulness. And so staying focused um, and, you know, managing your time, because like we talked about importance, um, how do we prioritize making this change? Maybe there are other environmental or situational supports. Um, and then I'll talk about some more um, potential resources when we talk about hope. All right, so I hope that's kind of helpful to think about. All right, then we go to, um, reframe, let me check my time too. All right, we're fine. So brainstorming um, is essentially the problem solving approach, right? So. Um, a problem solving model has us, you know, um, describe the problem, right? And then come up with as many possible solutions as possible. How might I accomplish this change? What are some different avenues I could take, different ways to do this? Um, and it, this comes back to, you know, this really should be the client's ideas, but if they need some help, we can um, provide some, but we need to, um, Think of as many as possible. You can do the, you know, pros and cons of each idea if you want. I probably would do like which one seen, ask the client which one seemed the most interesting or promising or acceptable to you. And then look at some pros and cons just for maybe, you know, the top two or three ideas. This kind of reminds me a little bit of, um, of agenda mapping. I don't know if anybody um, has done that, but that's a way to help identify the concerns or the problems that might be targeted. So this um, 
that would come before this, that when you're still focusing and trying to identify what, uh, where the client wants to start, you know, what issue or um, concern do we start with? We can do agenda mapping. So they just list them and they can rate each one, like how important is each one. And then that way you kind of eliminate some and then narrow it down to which ones do you really want to focus on now? Um, and then that's what you can then problem solve around. Then you take that one main issue or concern and brainstorm ideas on how to potentially address it. So looking for those potential solutions. So as you're listening to them talk about, well, this, I like this idea because they might start talking about, you know, ways that they're confident or not confident. So they're really essentially telling you which ideas are the most appealing because they feel the most um, confident about making that change. All right, does that make sense? Um, now, here's another one that is um, about reframing. So if you were in the developing discrepancy, we talked about using reframing. This is specifically to confidence building that really we need to reframe these when they are viewing past failures um, as sort of character flaws. So sometimes when they talk about failing in the past, um, and, and talk about it in a way that they're very down on themselves for it. They blame themselves, that very internalized kind of blame, that that's actually really defeats confidence that Mill and Rolnick talk about needing to, um, you know, redress that and to helping them think about um, these past failures as more related to external kind of factors that, the, or that they were situational um, and therefore can be changed. So the idea is that if they view it too internalized is that I'm a failure, um, I'm, I'm something's wrong with me, I'm flawed that I can't make this change rather than saying, well, that wasn't the right time. Um, here's some things, some factors that led to it not succeeding. So maybe I can address those factors and do it differently. So that's what you're trying to do with the reframing um, and trying to, um, like it talks about relying on research, like you don't want to say, oh, you know, I'm sure it'll work this time. Um, I know you can do it. So we're trying to be supportive, but these are all sort of platitudes um, that don't actually, um, they don't really build confidence in the person. So, you know, it might make them feel good about you, but it doesn't necessarily make them feel good about themselves. And that was something that I read and I apologize, I can't remember because I did some other research before I um, finished this. And um, one of it had to do with um, what seemed to hold back a client. There was a, there was a clinical example and the author was actually a different, a different book. Um, and he talked about the client who just seemed like she couldn't commit to making a particular change. And what they had to do was really get at her belief that, you know, she was somehow wrong rather than her understanding that, no, that's not, you know, no, there were other things going on at the time that now you can maybe control or change. So let's, I do have an example here for us to think about. All right, so how might you reframe this? So one of, so part of the reframe is thinking about um, trying to make it situational, like to give them feedback that, or like a reflection or feedback that frames it into not really all her fault, that it's, there are factors that went into what happened. So if she says, I think this is based on Sam, I said, I don't know why I can't seem to get control of what I'm feeling. I'm fine one moment and then screaming at my mom the next and I, I take my meds, but I still end up freaking out. And it's just so much backstabbing going on at school with my friends. And then I miss a bunch of school when I go inpatient. So what might you say? How can you reframe that? where she's, so she's feeling like I can't control this, right? 
So how do we reframe that? If you can type answers in. What might you say? What do you think might be situational about what she's talking about here? What aspect of this is situational? Well, the, this is Dawn Barris. The backstabbing going on at school is very situational. Yeah. Um, and, and missing um, like homework because she's impatient. I mean, that's temporary, right? That's situational. Uh huh. Um, let's see, Christina, sorry, let me see what Christina said. Sound, or Connie says, sounds like you feel loss of control and unsure of what to do. So you feel it's, Christina says, so you feel it's difficult to concentrate with these challenges. Yeah, so I think that kind of helps, you know, that these are, it's, it's difficult to figure out what to do different when you are dealing with these other situational things, right? Yeah, good. Um, and then if we were, remember, we talked about science, um, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, like, and I would maybe point out that she's says that she's taking her meds. So that would be like a strength, right? So that's something that you do have control over and you've been managing that. Um, but the use of some, uh, like science, remember it said like using some science in there, then it's okay to say, but you know, it's not uncommon for individuals with bipolar to require medication changes to find the right com combination. So yeah, you're dealing with a lot right now. So does that make sense that that's like, um, so that's sort of normalizing, isn't it? That's, that's what I would call normalizing. Um, but acknowledging what she's, she's experiencing and then kind of emphasizing that it's situational. All right, good, thank you. Now we have um, hypothetical thinking. So here you kind of um, are channeling your inner solution focused therapist again. And so this is to use the ifs, right? So suppose you did, it's almost like the miracle question, but a little bit more specific. So suppose you did succeed and we're looking back on it now, what most likely is it that worked? And how did that happen? You know, the miracle question usually starts more with what is different? How would you know that it's different? And then this kind of um, gets a little bit more specific and says, so how did you do that? How do you think that you made that work? How did that change happen? That wasn't a miracle, right? <laughs> it was something that you did different. Um, or you could say, suppose whatever their big obstacle is was removed. So then how might you go about making the change? So trying to get them to think past the obstacles to not let those keep them from imagining the change and um, sort of planning for the change. Another question is imagine your future wiser self and write a letter of encouragement to, your, to yourself and explain how you managed to make this change. So that might be an assignment that they're given to go home and think about it. You know write that letter and say, how did, you, how did you do that? That might be something I need to do, to write a letter to myself about how I'm supposed to quit eating so much junk. <laughs> so, this quarantine has been, it's, COVID has been rough on me <laughs> in my waistline. So that, I mean, that's really just hypothetical thinking. I do have a few um, sort of these, these what if kinds of questions, miracle-ish questions on these exercises here that you can find in the book. And then lastly, to kind of wrap up confidence talk so I can move on to hope, is that, you know, asking, asking these open-ended questions to get them to think about, um, you know, what steps would they take and um, how do they know they have some confidence, right? Um, what else could you do? 
So don't forget to, to ask those questions open-ended, affirm their strengths and abilities, um, use reflections to um, kind of repeat back to them so they hear themselves when they say things that indicate confidence. And summarizing their, basically their reasons um, for their optimism about the change. So you're looking for their, that's essentially looking for their sense of hope that where is their optimism? So optimism for change is, um, is part of successful changers. And I believe it's also a big part of people who are resilient, right? Is that they have a sense of hope and optimism about the future. I'll throw in a little resilience theory in there for you too. <laughs> okay. So now let's think about hope. So hope relates to the confidence, right? But it's more kind of about a feeling rather than a state, maybe a state of mind. And um, here again, my, my things are missing from my slide and I will need to figure that out before I do this again, before I do this uh, presentation again, this is crazy. Let me see if I can, um, hang on a second. I don't even know if I can get this one. Something happened here. Hang on. I got to get this smaller. No, that did not help. <laughs> yeah. This is all like, what? oh, here we go. I was like, come on, I need to get this in here. Okay, here we go. So um, strategies for reigniting hope. And these are you know, really from, from the Miller and Rolnick book, he talks a little bit about this, like how do you find hope? And that he really talks about, you know, how building their confidence is important to building their sense of hope. So that is true. And this is where taking small steps is, is um, really important to building confidence as well as, as hope. Um, but really uh, a bunch of what I'm gonna talk about in here um, is based on other research that I did for my book and how to um, reignite hope and inspiration. So that is what I'm going to talk about these strategies here real quick. Sorry, let me get back, move forward. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is ask you, um, how choose a word or phrase that explains where you find hope or how you find hope. So, you know, what, you know, think about things like maybe, you know, it's through prayer. Um, it might be through um, certain relationships with certain people. So keep it short because you're going to type it in. But what I need you to do now, actually, I'm going to put it here in the chat box too. If you go to, and you can, should be able to get to it if I type this in, poll, poll ev. So P-O, oh, sorry, I just sent that to Dale privately. Hang on just a second. Ah, hang on, <laughs> I miss, ah. Hang on, I have to get up to everyone. Sorry, everyone in meeting. Here we go, pollev.com. So maybe copy and paste that. So open up your web browser, go to pollev, and then the password is, or the, whatever it's called, is Angie Wood 783. So all caps, Angie Wood 783. And I'm gonna send that too. So do that and it should be open. So I'm going to, I'm gonna um, share that. I think I need to stop sharing my screen for a second. Hang on. Um, I need to share my internet. Where is it? Here we go. My Google Chrome. Here we go. And so everybody should, it should be working. I just have to figure, I've never hosted one before. So let's see, is it working? Are y'all seeing it? I lost my chat box. <laughs> so let me know if you're having problems getting to it. Andy doesn't know, there's my profile. Oh, wait here, maybe if I refresh my page. Okay, it should be in a presenting. Is it working? Ah. 
There you go. Okay, now it says, okay, four. All right. I think uh, I think when I click, there's a thing on my thing that says stop presenting. I don't know if you guys can see my screen. Yeah, you should be able to see my screen. All right, come on, people. What gives you hope? Well, this one doesn't have a timer on it. That would be nice, but oh well. 11, okay. So it should be a way that says, I think it says join, and then you put in Angie Wood 783. Here we go. Okay, so yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what I got here. Yeah, what well, gives you hope? Uh huh. Here we go. I was hoping that it would start to show. It's supposed to show stuff. Where did it go? No, 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 no. I want to show the chart. Save. It needs to show the chart. Come on. <laughs> it's a word cloud. Come on. Where is it? <laughs> no. Oh, come on. This is the only bad thing. I'm sorry, I don't. Edit. Need someone to teach me how to do it. Come on now. Like I just had it and then it disappeared on me. Total results. All right, here we go. Okay. Here we go. Oh, please don't disappear. I'm not going to touch anything. Maybe it won't disappear. Okay. So we have um, faith, family, God, um, purpose. I like that. Spirituality, your beliefs, resilient. Um, oh, let's see. I guess maybe it's better with one word, but um, trusting going on walks, your children, prayer, um, support, um, relationships, Jesus, nature, right? So I wonder if I can, if there's a way to like, I don't even know if I can save it, but yeah, I was like, this thing is a pain in the butt. Okay, <laughs> great. So there are some different ideas about, yeah, I was like, I, I'm, I'll have to learn that, that it needs to be one word. So I'll remember that next time I do this. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
the possibility of tomorrow and the challenges that we face today will not last forever. Okay. Yeah. All right, here, let me do stop on that one. Okay. All right, well, thank you for letting me um, test that one out. <laughs> okay. Let me go back to my portion of the screen. There we go. Okay. So what you can ask the client is, you know, what makes people feel hopeful? And that might be a good question when someone is really struggling with their own sense of hope, that they might not be able to answer it as well for themselves unless they think, you know, more um, outside of themselves. So sometimes that feels a little safer. So, um, so you can ask them that. Oh, just a second, sorry about that. Um, and then you could ask them about what makes you feel hopeful in general, and then what gives you hope about making this particular change. So here is another exercise that I did. Um, it is going to be a worksheet that you will um, get a copy of. And so it is called Finding Hope, and it has those questions. So what, right? Yeah, yeah. So it has those exact same three questions on a worksheet for the client. Now we think about inspiration. So, you know, hope giving you the idea that the future will be better and that inspiration is just maybe a little bit more about um, like inspires you to keep going. Um, so not just that things will be better, but it maybe inspires action, that it's a little bit more actionable than say hope. So where can you find inspiration? Could be another question that you ask and who inspires you so it might be a who and um so there is a sheet where um so this is another one that's included in there that i asked them um you know where can you find who so i just kind of those two combined together where they can talk about that you know where does inspiration come from and some of that might come from when you talked about hope like somebody wrote nature you know family so it might, inspiration might come from there. It could be, you know, reading the Bible or something, or maybe, um, you know, like I, I get inspired when I do read, um, I do look for and read different things about motivational reviewing from different authors. So I do, I find that inspiring. Um, and then the last piece is talking about what are some quotes and or images that inspire you to work towards your goal so these would be inspiration related to their goal um, and that I encourage them to create a vision board. So um, I did not put that in here. Um, no, let me write the note to myself. Example of vision board. Um, hopefully most of you know what I'm talking about that. I mean, you can do it any way you want or have the client do it any way that can include, you know, doing it digitally. It can include actually cutting things out, right. Of books uh, not books, but magazines, right. Um, or finding images online and printing them up and then putting them onto some kind of board. So it would represent images of their future that this is the, what inspires me. Um, so, you know, if it's, um, you know, if somebody's working towards maintaining abstinence and recovery from substance abuse, so how would things look better? You know, it might be like somebody who looks, um, you know, clean and well dressed. It's somebody working at a job. It's somebody enjoying time with family. So they might find images that relate to that, and they might find some quotes that are particularly inspirational and put those on there too. So a vision board is one way to help um, inspire hope. All right. Um, there's also um, the need to set up like a reward system. And some of this is actually part of getting to working on a particular change plan. So what are their um, actual plans? Like what steps do they need to take? Really kind of getting that goal down or what steps they're going to take but um, helping to reinforce that change, to help maintain that change, part of it is to have actually a system of rewards. Um, and so rewards can be, you, you want them to brainstorm different ideas 
and um, it, and then actually like the in the way my exercises are laid out in, in my book are that they just brainstorm a bunch of different ideas. And then the next one, they can pull from that or create some more that first list concrete rewards. So that would be actual material items. So it could be a book, you know, a record, clothing items, um, makeup. <laughs> See, what would a guy want? Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of some other examples of stuff that you might want, right? Um, what else? You guys help me think. So think of some, um, go ahead and uh, type those in there actually. Brainstorm some concrete rewards. So it'd be some more things. So I mentioned like makeup. Um, so these aren't, so it's not an event or an appointment, okay? So these would be actual like tangible items. Um, what are some ways that you reward yourself? Right, not Netflix show. Okay, ice cream. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe perfume or cologne. It could be dinner, maybe, or maybe somebody, or maybe purchasing dinner out. Mm -hmm. A nap, massages, shopping at Home Goods. Yeah, I like that one. Going out to eat, candles. I'd like a new car. That's kind of a big one though. <laughs> a movie. Yeah. Um, Amazon, shopping on Amazon, <laughs> fire in the fireplace. So can you see where some of those ideas, yeah, that tangible rewards aren't always, um, aren't always realistic and that, but some of what you mentioned are like relationship-based rewards, like, um, you know, spending time with someone, like I had um, one person uh, say, like maybe somebody else cooks dinner and you just enjoy, yeah, just sitting outside in nature. Um, my husband and I sometimes just like to have a beer and sit on our back patio and enjoy the nice weather while we wait for the grill to heat up or something or the food to cook on the grill, that that's a relationship-based reward. And then some of them could be events or activities um, like going to the movie, um, going out to eat, getting a massage. Now, some of those do require money, um, but like taking a nap doesn't require money. <laughs> um, maybe taking some time off, right? Going away, um, getting a manicure, watching something on television. Like my family do, um, we do, uh, we try to watch um, something most evenings. Occasionally we're all kind of busy when my daughter's too busy to sit down with us. But since, especially since quarantine, like we watch the entire 15, we'll actually work through the 14 seasons of Supernatural. That that's what we would watch most evenings. One or two episodes that we all sat down together um, with our three dogs and watched, watched those on, I think that was through Netflix. So, you know, that was really a relationship kind of thing that we were, um, you know, taking the time to spend time with each other, talking to a friend long distance, reading a book. Yeah, taking a soak in the tub. I really like that. Yeah, playing some games on your phone. Um, so what can, you know, you think of, and if, if you can think of some things and maybe you can help your clients think of some things that are reasonable as um, Jane mentioned that, you know, they can't, you know, always afford big extravagant things, but what could still be meaningful in terms of relationships or other activities or events. So having some kind of um, brainstorming those ideas and helping them kind of narrow those down and maybe link them with certain, um, certain accomplishments. All right, so um, another um, I was just trying to think, sorry, y'all. I was getting distracted because I was thinking about, I wonder if there's like, because I don't think I have a list um, in my book, but that was just something I thought of was like, well, what about like an idea, just like we have for the strengths, you know, is like a list of possible rewards. Um, 
you know, and I'm sure you could Google that and find something online. Like what are some potential things you could reward yourself with that don't cost a lot of money? So that, that might help. Okay. Another thing is to seek positive information each day. So I kind of mentioned this mindfulness aspect that I, I did bring into um, the work, into the activities in my workbook. So part of it is to seek information daily, to stay focused and um, to, you know, it could be typically it's going to be something related to the change that needs to be made. So, you know, say somebody um, in recovery might read a little bit of, you know, the big book or some, um, what do you call those, um, like meditations, right? Um, is it looking up some, some information on websites? Um, so I've kind of listed some suggestions here, apps, books, newspapers, television shows, magazines, social media, um, you know, where can they find positive information, right? So those might be particular sites um, that they're going to, or particular apps. Um, I was going to say particular, yeah, um, pages, like particular Facebook pages, for example, that might be inspiring. So um, you know, looking, looking at those, you know, how like in Facebook, there's a groups, like you can view the latest kind of posts in the groups that you belong to. So that might be one way to sort of focus it and help the person think about that. So that's another um, worksheet that you will have. So seeking positive information daily. So those are the categories provided so that they can brainstorm um, different ways that they can um, look for the information that's relevant to their particular change. We also, I mentioned taking small steps, that this would be based on their particular change plan um, and what are the steps or the objectives uh, from that change plan that um, can um, how can they enact, I'm sorry, how can they enact those objectives from the change plan to implement them and taking just, <clears throat> sorry, even small little steps, um, anything that can, um, you know, just uh, are those that you just kind of the baby steps idea, right? So this is another one that is uh, a worksheet that is included. And basically it says, um, if the objective, so the, you know, this person's goal is to lose weight <clears throat> or become more healthy or whatever. And the, um, one of the objectives that this person will accomplish is to limit myself to 1800 calories a day. So that's the objective. And then what are the ideas on how to make sure that you eat an 1800 um, calorie diet? Well, the ideas are include that I will fill my fridge with healthy foods that are enjoyable and filling. I will decide what kinds of high fat and high carb foods I'm willing to postpone eating for now. So maybe taking some things off the table. So, um, you know, foods that are um, actually more, what's the word for it? They're, um, they're, uh, is it not, I think the foods that are not calorie dense, maybe somebody out there knows what I'm talking about, that, uh, for example, um, you know, if you think about like how much, say, cantaloupe you could eat, right? So a good size bowl of cantaloupe for the amount of calories and literally, you know, how much food that is to fill your stomach is, um, is a better bet than eating like a very small piece of chocolate that has the same amount of calories because you're gonna feel more full with the cantaloupe. <clears throat> so that's the filling piece that so they're enjoyable and filling. And then maybe there might be some things you say for now because actually the, the research says that you don't tell yourself I can't have it. You just say, I'm not going to have it for right now. That's another one of those psychological tricks <laughs> um, that's important. So. 
Um, so those are that's just an example um, of how we might help them identify what are those small steps that they would be willing to do. And that actually people who maintain changes typically are ones who slowly build build into it. You get used to some of the changes and then you add more changes rather than trying to change everything all at once. And I think that that to me is often what tends to sabotage um, and really demoralize a lot of families that we work with. So if you're dealing, say, for example, with child welfare families, you know, the parents are trying not to lose custody of their kids or have already lost custody of their kids. And they have 5 million things that they are told they must do. And they have to do a bunch of it before the next court date. It's extremely intimidating and very, um, it's very demoralizing. So finding what are the small steps that they would be willing to take and you know build on so that over time you know we have to think you know in in the small steps and try not to overwhelm people all right um another one is i think this is the last one here all right finding and i think we're doing good on time perfect so finding community um is the final one so this isn't just getting information so that previous uh what two slides ago where it was about um find it was about information so it's just keeping you focused and learning this one is about your support so where do you find your community of support um and so this is um uh, in my book where i do give these different areas for them to think about you know can they do um, any kind of online support groups or forums um, support groups maybe in their area. So if they can't do the online stuff or don't do that, um, maybe just even hobby or interest groups might be a way to find a connection with other people. It doesn't have to necessarily be about the change. Uh, maybe there's programs or services, right, that would be helpful to them. And just any, any other ideas that they might have for finding that kind of, I guess it could be at a church. Um, sometimes church have small groups that get together, like women's groups or things like that. Um, I was thinking about like online support groups um, were really helpful to me because sometimes you can't necessarily find the support group in your area. Um, you know, usually AA and kinds of groups are found most places. And I think some of them are actually online right now. But um, I remember... Um, you know, 16, more, 16 or more years ago, I was dealing with infertility that I wasn't able to get pregnant and I really needed support. And I just didn't know anybody going through what I was going through. I, that wasn't a community I was gonna find where I lived. So I went online and I'm still friends with several of the women um, that I met through those forums that we all struggled um, to get pregnant. So sometimes um, finding specific forums um, and other times it's just finding just that group, right? Finding, finding your tribe um, that helps you feel supported. And then, um, how, you know, kind of coming up with ideas, but then asking them, so which one, which idea or ideas are the most appealing to you? So which ones would you like to pursue? And then what steps do you need to take to actually connect with those? So what do you need to do to find them, right? So it isn't just, oh, okay, go do it, right? It's like, do you know how to do it? Do you need help doing it? All right, okay. So any other questions, comments? Oh, here I can send, uh, now the file, the, um, uh lindsay will have this up on the website I, I already sent it to her but uh but i can also see if i can't send it to you guys let me see if it'll come through here this is the powerpoint and oh, i just did that again dale you're messing me up i gotta send it to everyone <laughs> i just keep messing that up okay to everyone and if you have any questions, go ahead and write them in there. So I'm going to send you that. And then the other PDF is all of the worksheets that are just in one. Sorry, I just scanned them all. It is easier that way to put them all into one, um, that one file. So the, so the worksheets that you saw in the PowerPoint, those are the ones that I'm sending to you guys that I'm able to send to you.